This is the day. This is the day. That I lost This is the day. This is the day. That I lost me. That I lost me. you at the point of need. May he reveal his loving kindness and his mercy towards you. Let us pray. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Holy Michael, the holy and almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your presence today to honor and worship you. Father, sanctify our hearing, sanctify our seeing, sanctify our understanding with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let his seeds of life fall upon the souls of our hearts today. Let our lives be changed by the word that we're going to receive today. I'm not your speaker, I'm not your children. Let your word become real in our lives today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And today we're reading the first lesson from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 17. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 17. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 17. 
And this is a prophetic passage that speaks of the calling of our Savior Jesus Christ, how God spoke this message through the prophet Isaiah of the coming of our Savior and what he was going to do on the earth. It also talks of his second advent. You know, Jesus Christ has come first time as a sacrifice for our sins, but the second time he's going to come, he's going to come as a conquering warrior, an avenger and a judge. So no longer will he come as a sacrifice. The second time will come to judge you and I. We should put that in remembrance um, that God spoke into existence of his son. He said, Behold my servants whom are called, my elect in whom my soul delighted. My elect in whom my soul delighted, I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles who did not know God, they will come to know him through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's servant, God's elect that he chose. He said, in whom my soul delighted. We know that's what God said when our Lord Jesus Christ was uh, baptized in the river Jordan, when he came out, he had a voice and said, this is my beloved son, in whom my soul was well, well, well pleased. He said, I put my spirit upon him. This is true. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus Christ from his baptism and everything he did was according to that spirit in him. So let's go to Isaiah 11, 2, and Matthew 3, 17, and uh, Matthew 12, 18. So this passage talks of the advent, the first entrance of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth to accomplish the work that God asked him to, to do. So. Isaiah 11, 2, Matthew 3, 17, and Matthew... Uh, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Yes. The spirit of wisdom mm -hmm. and understanding. Yes. The spirit of counsel mm -hmm. and might. Yes. The spirit of knowledge mm -hmm. and of the fear of the Lord. Yes. So the seven spirits of God that were our Lord Jesus Christ when he came to the earth. And see, he named all of them knowledge and counsel, wisdom and might, power, understanding. Those spirits are the spirits that enabled him to do what he did. In fact, he himself said that it's the Father that lives in me that do the works. He did not acknowledge anything according to himself. He said it was God in him that did all the works. Okay, um, Matthew 3 17 and Matthew 12 18. Matthew 3 17. Matthew 3, 17, and that says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That was at his baptism, and he came out of the water. So, God is, when God said this in Isaiah, he confirmed it in Matthew when he finally appeared. This is what I prophet prophesied about him. He said, In whom my soul delighted. God said, I am pleased in him. It was at the age of 30 years that Lord Jesus Christ started his ministry. And Matthew 12, 18, yes. uh, it says that, um, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So this time you and I that we cannot do anything, one, without being called by God, and two, without God putting his spirit upon us. So you need two things to do the work of the Lord. One, to be called by Him, and two, to have Him anoint you with the Spirit. If you're not called, and you go and do God's work, you will fail miserably. And if you're called and you don't have His Spirit, the same thing would happen. Because the Spirit of the, of the Lord that would empower you and give you the power to overcome the force of darkness and to do God's will in your life. Without that Spirit, you will not be able to do it. So our Lord Jesus Christ was sent, he was called, and he was anointed with the Spirit. The Bible says that he, had, he was given the Spirit without measure. He shall, he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard 
in the street, a grocery to lean up break, and the smoking flax to lean up quench. He said, bring forth judgment to the truth. And that was this person that God is sending his son, who is very humble and meek. He will not promote himself, as we know that many times in the New Testament, when Jesus healed people, he would tell them not to tell others, but go and show themselves the priests, showing how meek he was, very humble. So he himself said, he said, I'm meek and humble, you find rest for your souls when you come to me. And when he says, bring forth judgment of truth, it means that he shall reveal the truth of the judgment of God. Jesus Christ said, and the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. So he is the truth, and he will reveal this truth to us. Many of us live in deception. Uh, we live according to the deities of this world. And of course, we get led astray. We don't go up on God's standard. We, we falsely believe we are doing God's will, but in, in fact, we are not. You know, so that's why I said that. Uh, he will reveal the truth to judgment. Many of us are falsely doing the wrong things because everybody is doing it. No, no, that, that is wrong. We have to check our Bible to see the falsehood of what the world system is. So by saying that a bruised juice did not break and the smoking flax did not quench, you say that this person is very humble. He's not going to be a braggart. He's not going to be somebody oppressing others because of his power. No, he just never boasted his power. He never use this power like that, you know. And so it shall not fail nor be discouraged in the self judgment of the earth, and the earth shall wait for his law. You know, despite all the tribulations experienced, the rejection, the opposition, the persecution, Jesus Christ did not give up on God. He set his face as a flint to go and die on the cross, which was his main mission on this earth to be a sacrifice. So let's go to Hebrews 12, verse 2. So he shall not fail, not be discouraged. Many of us, we fail and we get discouraged when we encounter a lot of opposition, a lot of persecution in our lives. We must look at our example, our Lord Jesus Christ as an example to copy. He never failed, he never got discouraged, he never got despondent. He kept on with the commission that had been given to the end. He said, until the said judgment of the earth, that judgment was the judgment of sin on the cross. How sin was judged on the cross by the sacrifice of, our, of his body. So, um, Hebrews 12, verse 2. Yes. And Genesis 49, verse 10. Hmm? By looking up to Jesus. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Right hand of God the Father. He said, he said, because of the joy that was set for before him, what was that joy? That joy was to get, get the salvation for you and I. That uh, the famous song that says that while I was on the cross, I was on his mind. Because of the joy to see thousands of people come to the cross, come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, he endured the cross. You see, he endured. He didn't come down from the cross like the, the robbers wanted him to do. You know, he endured the shame. Just for me and just for you. you see, many of us don't know what Christ did for us, so we don't appreciate it. He did a lot to save our souls. It was only the sacrifice of his body that could cleanse us of all sin. Without that, uh, we will still be held in our own sins. Genesis 49, verse 10. Genesis 49. Genesis 49, verse 10. Genesis 49, verse 10. Yes. The tempter shall not depart from the children. Yes. Nor a lawgiver from between its feet. Yes. Also shall all comes. Hmm? And to him shall be the gathering of the people. The of the people. Yes. The gathering of people shall come to him. Through him, many shall come to know God because of his sacrifice. Because what he did, many have come to God because of him. So that was the joy that, that he saw, that he endured the cross with. Thus said God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, 
He that spread for the earth and that which comes out of it, he that giveth bread to the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant to the people, a light to the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenants. It was because of him and the blood that he shed that you and I are under the new covenant with God today. So God was saying that this person is sending to be the covenant for the people. That was through him I will enter into covenant with the people. For those that will believe in him and believe in what walk, walking at the cross, he will be that covenant and a light to the Gentiles. You know, that was the Gentiles were in darkness. But the light came and brought us out of darkness unto his light. Luke 2 32, Acts 13 47. Luke 2 32. Acts 13, 47. Luke 2, 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles. Yes. And the glory of thy people Israel. The glory of thy people Israel. That is exactly what it came to do. And Acts 13, 47. For so the Lord has commanded us. Yes. Yes. That you be for salvation to, to the, the ends of the earth. earth. So we can see that everything God said to Prophet Isaiah was fulfilled in the New Testament. You know, God spoke about him coming thousands of years before he did, and everything that was said about him he fulfilled. In fact, he himself said that the whole word of God was about him, that they spoke of him. And what was he coming to do? Not going to be the light of the Gentiles. Is to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and then that sits in darkness out of the prison house. So this was confirmed. He himself read this when he was given the, part, the book of the law. Let's go to Luke 4 18. Luke 4 18, 2 Timothy 2 26. So this is the commission was given to open the blind eyes. But when he says the blind eyes, what is he referring to? Those who are spiritually blind, not physically blind. Those, I mean, those who don't know God, you know, and those who are in prison, who are being held in prison by the forces of this world, the witches and wizards of this world, to set them free, and those who are in darkness to come to the light. One. So. Yeah. Look for it. Yes. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh huh. Because he has anointed me, has anointed me. To, gospel, to the poor. Yes. He has sent me to do the token of it. Mm -hmm. Preach deliverance to captives. To bring deliverance to captives. Mm -hmm. And recovery of sight to blind. See? To it's... set at liberty. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's it. And 2 Timothy 2.26. He himself read that passage and he told them that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. God sent him to open the blind eyes, to open the prison doors, to heal the broken hearted, and all these things he came to do. So that means if you are afflicted by one of those things, you have a ready made solution through Jesus Christ. You don't have to come to him because that's why he was sent, because of you, because of the particular problem, to set you free from the captivity of Satan. Maybe you're in bondage to the force of darkness, maybe you're bondage to drug addiction, pornography, prostitution, and you don't know how to get out. Then Jesus is waiting for you today. As soon as you agree for him to come to your life, he will come and set you free from all those chains. As soon as you to change you. Second Timothy 2 26. Yes. And that they may come to their senses mm -hmm. and escape the snare of the devil. Yes. Having been taken captive by him. him. Yes. And God continued speaking to the prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I not give to another in that my praise to graven images. So God is saying that he will not share his glory with graven images. That means idols. Now, if you're in the church of God and you're still going to worship an idol, maybe you have an idol in your house or you're going to a shrine during the weekends, God would not give you anything because if he gave you anything, you're going to give that glory to that idol, not to God. So God already said he's not going to share his glory. If you want to come to him, you have to come to him fully, not halfway. In the church today, we have many people who are half-half, one foot in the church, 
one foot in the world. And they are asking God for all kinds of things. Well, God will not give it to them because if he did, they will go and give glory to that idol, not to God. Isaiah 48, verse 11. 48, verse 11, and that says that for my own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it? For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. God will not share his glory. This is why many of us have not received the answers to our prayers because we are one leg with God, one leg with the world. We are doing half half, and God sees everything. You cannot hide it from Him. You can hide it from men and women in this world because you can go secretly in the night and all these things. But even the darkest places, God knows where you're going. So God says, I will not share. But if you want me, you've got to have me fully, not half half. It is, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before the spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise on the end of the earth. He that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the hours and the happiness thereof. So he's talking about praising God. You know, because of what he has done, a new song and praises from the ends of the earth. You know, that's you and I are supposed to praise God. This is part of our calling. We're supposed to offer praises, a sacrifice of praise unto our Lord. Let the wilderness and the cities lift up their voices, let the villages that Peter don't have it. Let the inhabitants of the top of the rock sink, let them shout on the top of the mountains. So we have cause to praise God for He has saved us. You and I are only here today because of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So He is worthy to be praised, whatever praises. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare His praise unto the islands. And in terms of the second advent, when He comes back, that the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man to stir up jealousy. Like a man of war, shall cry, Ye roar, shall prevail against his enemies. The enemies of God are those who don't follow Jehovah, they are the Antichrists. They are those who are against the principles and dictates of Jesus Christ. God is saying there's coming a time to come to judge them. I have long holding my peace, I have been still, I refrain myself, but now I have cried like a traveling woman, like a woman in labor. I will destroy and devour what. So at the end of the times when the Antichrist is ready to kill the of God, God will rise up and defend them. I will totally destroy the Antichrist and his armies. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all the herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up those poles. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, so I will lead them by paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. So in the time of the need, when the Antichrist was about to slaughter the kingdom of God, who will rise up and defend them and lead them to safety, we will not let them be killed. They said, we turn back, they said, we greatly ashamed that trust in graven images, that say to the mortal images, you are gods. So God, God was saying, those that trust in images, that have their faith in them, they shall be ashamed. They shall be ashamed. You know? If you are one of the people who come to church, but go back to go and meet a witch doctor or Baba Lao in the evening or the weekends, you are only for yourself. Because sooner or later you are exposed for who you are, and you cannot get anything from God. God knows that if He gave it to you, you are going to be giving it to that Father that will not to Him. As I said earlier, He will not share His glory with anyone. So the God is talking about to have a more to have a mind, a single straight mind with Him, and not be worshiping idols. God hates idolatry. As I said, He said there's a jealous God. He said there's a of jealousy. That you know, will anger at His enemies, and He will destroy them. I would say it's a terrible thing to fall in the hand of the living God. If you don't want that judgment, we must remain straightforward to serve Him wholly and only Him. So that's how serve the Lord and the God with our strength, the mind, everything you have to serve God. Don't keep anything out from Him. Um, he wants His blessings, therefore, He will bless those who truly trust Him, not those who trust Him halfway and give the other half to idols. I know many people in the church are like that. They only use the church as a front 
and we're going to actually apply that real trust is in the head of the head at home or in the most friend of religious. That's why they run to their problems. God knows such people. And those people, when they die, they will never see Jesus Christ because Satan has put his mark on them. He has put his mark on them. So God hates idolatry. And that's what it says in Exodus 20, verse 1. You can read it. Exodus 20, verse 1. God will not share his glory. He will not share his things with those who are idol idolaters. So we'll mark 20, verse 1, yes. And God spoke all these words, saying, yeah. And the Lord God, and the Lord God, mm -hmm. yes. Go on, verse 3. That shall have no other God for me. That shall not make. You have to remember that, that God's promise to show mercy to those who keep his commands for a thousand generations. So long after you've gone, God will still be showing mercy to your descendants because of your own commitment to him. He has promised that. So that's why many generations of people in this world are suffering because their parents and grandparents did not serve God. You know, and so they will be judged and their offspring will be joined in turn. So this is summary of the first passage. God is saying that he's going to send our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be very humble and meek and lowly. And he's going to you know, save us from our sins and so we also praise him. And also apart from that, he said he will open the blind eyes, open the prison doors, lead out those who are in darkness with lights. All this he just came to do. And all this he's still doing through his spirit. And only come to him. You that are blind spiritually, he will open your eyes to see spiritually. And darkness will bring you out into his light. He made the day, the, the night light to you. So, you know, if you're needing these things in your life, you're needing healing, restoration, come to Jesus today and he will give it to you. Now, the next passage in the book of Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to uh, 37. Okay, but when Jesus knew it, knew what? He withdrew himself. From thence and great crowds followed him and he healed them all. So in, if you go to the previous verse 14, it says then the Pharisees went out and they held a council, the meeting to what? How do I destroy Jesus? And Jesus knew about that plot, that conspiracy to destroy him. You know, he could have destroyed those people back if he wanted, but he didn't take that part because he knew that he came to die as a sacrifice for my sins and your sins. So because of that, he did not, he did not uh, confront them. So he would go from there where they were planning to kill him, and they brought to him all the world that were sick and he healed them all. You don't see that nowadays. Many healing crusades, you see just a few people healed and the rest go back disappointed. But in the time of Jesus, everyone was healed. Everyone. Nobody went home disappointed. Everyone was healed of the disease. Now, when he was doing this, he charged them that you should not make him known. You see, that's exactly what I said. He charged them. Most of us, if we have a single miracle in our church, we'll go and announce it on CNN, National News, we'll do a video of it. We'll, do, we'll write a book about it. We'll try to announce as much as we can. That was not the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. He always told people, don't tell anybody I've killed you. you know, give glory to God. That's all. So we must learn from him and follow his example. Not to promote ourselves, you know, not to try and announce ourselves. If you're truly doing the work of God, God himself will promote you through the miracles that happen in ministry. You don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to announce anything. People will hear of it and they will come. 
once you begin to announce it and do all this, then you are not doing God's work. You are just doing your own, your own plans, you are following your own plans, you are working in the flesh. So when he knew that they wanted to kill him, he withdrew from there, and the crowds followed him everywhere he went to follow, because he knew that he had the healing power. You know, the crowd followed him. So let's go to Psalm 139, verse 2. And Matthew, verse 7. He withdrew himself from there. The great crowds followed him. So he never promoted himself, he didn't go of course there was no television then. But the works which he did are the ones that announced him. Go on. That's two, yes. And the second passage, Matthew verse 7. Matthew verse 7. Matthew verse 7. Matthew verse 7. 7 7. And Mark 3. Mark 3. Ah, no. I read this. All right. Verse 7. Yeah. But Jesus will do himself with his disciples. Yes. And from Galilee, followed him. See. They followed him because of the miracles which he did. The miracles are supposed to be baits for the people to come, see the power of God, and to be preached unto from whence they will surrender their lives to God. There was not an end in itself. Some of you, you go to miracle process to only receive miracles. And God knows your heart that once you are healed of that disease, you'll never step in church again. That's how many of you don't receive your healing. See, but if you're going to seek Jesus only, then he will heal you knowing that you keep on following him. But if you're just going purely for selfish reasons to be healed of a disease and you've made up your mind that, oh, once I'm healed, I will never step in this church again, then God knows he will not give you that healing. So the great crowds followed him and he told them, he chided them that they were not making known Fulfill what we just read in Isaiah, that behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. You know, we the Gentiles were out of God's covenant, and Jesus Christ was sent to show us judgment. We were brought in because of his sacrifice. We were brought in. And um, he shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruise reach may not break, a smoking flash may not point again. This is exactly what we read. So, this Matthew felt the fulfillment of uh, Isaiah 42 1 to 7 that we just read. And said, In his name shall the Gentiles trust. You and I are Gentiles, we are not Jews, and we trust in Jesus. He brought us, we that were outside were brought into the covenant of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And his name to the gate of trust and said that was brought unto him one possessed of the devil, blind and dumb. That means he could not see and he could not talk. That's a terrible affliction. It's one's bad enough that you cannot see. At least if you can talk, you can express what you want. But if you're blind and dumb, that means both avenues of communication have been closed. And this was a satanic demonic spirit that possessed this one afflicted him. You know. And they brought him to Jesus and healed him so much so that the man spoke and saw. So we see Jesus came to release the captive. This man was a captive of Satan. Satan had bound him and blinded him and made him dumb. But Jesus cast out the demon and the man was free. If you're dumb, if you're blinded today, Jesus Christ is able to heal you. To set you free from that bondage, you only have to come to him. This is why he came. This is why he died on the cross to set you free from the afflictions, from the bondages, from the prison houses you've been put. And all the people were surprised and said, Is not this the son of David? In other words, we know this man. He grew up in the neighborhood. How come he has his powers to heal people? See, they, they were not impressed with him because they knew his origins. That's why Jesus Christ said, A prophet has no honor except in his own country. Because he grew up with them, they knew him, they did not place any value on whatever he did. They felt he was an ordinary man. 
That's what happened. He was the one who knew God and he performed the miracles. He didn't even believe it. He thought he was just joking. But when the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the one who were two main sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So when the Pharisees heard about it, they said, this fellow cast out devil by the devil by the prince of the devils. They said he was using juju or magic. Just like today, when people hear the miracles, some people they say, oh, it's fake or it's using magic. And many of them truly are using magic to deceive the people. I've seen many WhatsApp posts of uh, former fake prophets confessing their sins, how they deceive the people through fake miracles. But this was not the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew their thoughts because the only signs uh, told them every kingdom divided against itself is brought to devilation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against his own kingdom. How shall then his kingdom stand? In other words, Jesus was telling them if he was using the power of the prince of the devil, Beelzebub, to cast out demons, he was working against his own kingdom. And his kingdom will not stand. What I'm trying to tell you today, Satan is the father of division. Whenever you find division in churches and houses, you know Satan is the one behind it. God wants you to be united, but Satan wants to separate you. Don't give him a chance. So if you are divided against your church, against each other, then that church, you know, the devil splits and come to an end and giving Satan what he wanted. Galatians 5.15. Galatians 5.15. And Revelation 2, 23. Revelation 2, 23. So he's just warning us against division. That's the whole message there. Don't let people divide you, your family, your husband, your wife, your children. You might think you are proving your own right, but in reality, you're working for the devil when you're allowing him to separate you from your wife or from your children. You only have everything to lose. Go on. Revelation 2, 23. Yes. And I will kill our children with death. Mm -hmm. And all the churches shall know that I am. I am. He who searches the words and heart. Yes. And I will give unto everyone of you according, according to your works. See? Everyone will be repaid according to their works. That's why you must not start pitying or crying about people when you hear what happened to them because you don't know what they've done in secret against others. You only see the surface, oh, it was such a nice man. Who told you it was such a nice man? How do you know it was not in a wooden confraternity using people's blood to renew his life and all this thing? You don't know that. So when he dies suddenly, he starts crying. You don't know the full details of his life. Okay, uh, Galatians 5.15. Galatians 5.15. 15.15. Listen 5.15. But if you bite and devour one another, mm -hmm. if you bite and devour one another, beware. Hmm? Lest you be consumed mm -hmm. by one another. See? Lest you become. This is the work of Satan. When it causes you to start fighting each other, you know, and devouring each other, you're only walking for him because that's what he wants. He wants you separated. He wants your family separated. He wants your church separated. Always remember that when there are clashes in the church, there are groups. Know that you are doing Satan's work. Rebuke him, cast him out in prayer, and you find everything will turn to normal. But if I by visible but cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God come upon you. It says that you exorcists, uh, they call them exorcists. Even the, the book of Acts with Paul happened. The sons of Sceva, they're trying to cast out a, a demon, and the demon. Pounds of them and beat them, seven of them, and tore their clothes. So I said, if I use the devil, what do, what do your children use? That was your children are the ones you use for darkness, not me. And he said that if I use the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Look, 11 20, Hebrews 12 28. That's what you and I want to see the demonstrable presence of the kingdom of God on our churches. On a community where people can see the raw power of God manifesting in their lives 
people have been delivered, set free of a planet I've seen, that gas have stopped. If they're crippled, they'll lay walking. That's what you and I need to see. That's what is going on. Luke 11, 20. Well, for he by his, the Savior of God cast out them. Mm -hmm. And no doubt the Savior of God is upon you. See, no doubt the Savior of God is upon you. And Hebrews 12, 28. Uh, 1228. Hebrews 1228. Yes. Since we are receiving the kingdom, yeah. which cannot be shaken, yes. let us have grace mm -hmm. by which we may serve God yes. acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's it. Let us have grace by which we may serve God in godly fear. So, how can you enter into a strong man's house? Jesus is speaking as Paul and take his goods. Except before the bind the strong man, and then you can take his goods. In other words, if I'm casting out demons among you, know that I've already bound that demon and I've taken his goods, his goods that man that was possessed of set him free from his power. See, only a greater power can do that. For somebody to be delivered of a demon, the demon has to be cast out first, overpowered, and then his captive set free. Loose from his chains, and that person will be free. That's what Jesus was saying. That for me to cast out devils, the power of God has come upon that person, a greater power. I will both bind that strong man with both feet and hands. After he's bound and he cannot move, then you release the captive, which is the person that has been tormented. So he that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me is scattered abroad. So Jesus is saying that you and I have to be with him fully, not half and half. If you're not gathering with him, then you're against him. That's how he looks at it. Therefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost was saying that because they were saying he was using the power of the abysmal, uh, when actually he was in the power of God. So it's another blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You know, so it says that that kind of that's that kind of sin will not be forgiven in this world or the world to come. Let's go to Acts 7 51, Hebrews 6 verse 4. Now, if you don't know the Holy Spirit, you cannot really blaspheme against him. It's for those who like Christians who have known and tasted of the power of God that can be they are the ones that can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 6 verse 4, Acts 7 51. 6 verse 4. Yeah. Or it's impossible for or it is impossible yes. for those who are once enlightened. Aha. Uh -huh. And are stars of the heavenly gate. Yes. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And have tasted the good word of God. Aha. Uh -huh. And the powers of the word mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. If they shall fall away, to renew them and yes. came mm -hmm. unto repentance. That's it. But the fire of God. God. See. So it's only those that have known the Holy Spirit intimately can, can blaspheme him again. When they sin against the Holy Spirit, having known him, that is the unforgiving, forgiving sin, the forgivable sin. And he said, Whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven him. Whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world or the world to come. So if you're a child of God and you've already known the Holy Spirit, you've seen his power, and then you turn against him, you commit a forgivable sin, and you will not be forgiven. This that means you're gonna be sent going to hell in this world or world to come. You will not be forgiven because that's a forgivable sin. For those who have not tasted the power, they cannot sin against the Holy Spirit because they don't even know who he is. You know, and Jesus continues, says that make the tree good and its fruit good. Or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruits. You see, a man is known by his behavior, by what he, how he behaves, how he talks, how he tells you what kind of spirit is in him. You can be saying you are this or that. It doesn't impress anybody. Show us the fruits by the way you live, and we'll be convinced. Just Christ said, by the fruits we shall know them. You know, by the fruits. Luke 6 43. And that's 717. 
Luke 6.43 as I 7.17. By their fruits, which I know that a tree is known by its fruits. You cannot get a mango tree from a mango fruit from a tree which is not a mango tree. Uh, Luke 6.43. Yes. For a good tree, for a good tree, bring, bring it not forth corrupt fruit. Mm-hmm. Another tree, corrupt tree, bring forth yeah. good fruit. That's it. A tree, you are known by your fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. Yes. For a strong man, do not gather fruit. Yes. No, for a bramble bush, gather the fruit. That's it, that's fine. So Jesus told them quite clearly that a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. So you will not hear an evil man by what they say, how they behave, how they carry themselves. They don't have to tell you, you can know. The same with a good person, you will know from the way they speak, the way they behave, that there is a good person inside. But then he reminded them that, let, let me tell you, that every idle word that the man shall speak, they shall give account, therefore, the day of judgment. So, all of you speaking bad things and saying you're joking, <laughs> there's no joking in heaven. Every word you've spoken, you have to defend it. You've sinned against God, you better go and repent now. Because on the day, there'll be no repentance. Once you die, there's no repentance. And every idle word that men speak, they shall give account for. By your word shall be justified, that means set free, and by your word shall be condemned. You don't know, you don't want your word to condemn you on the day of judgment. Ephesians 5 verse 4. So be very careful what comes out of your mouth. Of course, what comes out of your mouth is what is your heart. If you have a good heart, nothing bad will come out of your mouth. But if you have a bad heart, and all the evil in your heart will be coming out. Ephesians 5 verse 4. Go we see Ephesians 5 verse 4. Ephesians 5 verse 4. Yes. Neither filthiness. Neither filthiness. Nor no, quite joking. Or jesting. Or jesting. Which are not convenient. And convenient. Or rather giving of thanks. Uh-huh. But rather giving of thanks, see? That's what God wants us to be doing. Not filthiness, crack, dirty jokes, foolish talking, jesting. We cannot convene for other kind of things. Many of the way you do that, you say, oh, you are joking. <laughs> There's no joke. Everything you've said has been recorded against you in the Heaven's Book, and you have to defend it. Just say, rather than cracking dirty jokes, always give thanks to God for everything. You know, always give God thanks. So we see in this passage, God has spoken to us of the advent of His Son. First time He was going to come and die for our sins. The next time to judge us. Uh, you know, so we must prepare for a second return you know, to live holy, righteous lives. We must not sin against God. We must not follow idols. You know, God said we will not share His glory with an idol. And He came to set the captives free. If you're captive of sin right now, today is a day of release as long as you can accept Jesus into your life. If you're captive of pornography or chemical addiction or prostitution, whatever sin, if you're captive to that, you cannot free yourself, you've tried everything. Then today is a day of freedom once you receive Jesus Christ. So if you're watching me and you're preparing your heart, you're not yet born again, then follow me by saying this short prayer. And Jesus Christ will come into your heart and relieve you, take you out of that prison of sin, and make you free and walk upright in Him. Say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against God and man. Have mercy and forgive me my sins today. Wash me with your precious blood. Make me holy and pure. Come inside my heart, rule and reign over me today. Now take my name from the book of the dead, that is those going to hell, and put my name in the book of life. Those that will inherit the heavenly mansion, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Send a simple prayer. You are truly born again from, from the heart, and Jesus Christ will come inside your heart and mold you and change you to become like Him so that you can inherit your holy mansion in heaven. 
They will change you inside the cold has gone. Your taste will change, your friends will change. They will notice the difference in you. Because you are now a new creature. You're not the same person. You might have the same characteristics, same figure, same body, but you're a different, a different spirit walking in you. And God wants to teach you his way and make you be like his son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Jehovah. Jesus Christ, come back up. Thank you for the praise of all the life today. We thank you for sending your son to die in our place. To be the sacrifice for our sins that we can receive the gift of salvation. Thank you that we Gentiles have received the truth through him. Father, we know we owe a debt that we cannot pay. And he paid a debt he did not owe. Father, accept our thanks on our behalf today. We know you just trust our Lord Jesus Christ coming back to earth to enjoy the world. Let us be happy worthy to go with him when he comes. Let us not be cast away. Deliver us from idolatry. Let us be united with you and be pure inside you. Let us follow Christ in every way of our lives. Uh, let uh, the fruit of our lips be uh, acceptable in your sight. Sanctify our hearts. Remove the spirit of division. Give us spirit of unity and love. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. And that's it for today. Make sure you meditate on these words. You read it again. God will minister it into your spirit. And you pray constantly and you fellowship with other Christians. God will maintain you and manifest God in your life and keep you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is a miracle walking God is the Alpha and Omega. Is a miracle walking God. Hallelujah. Is a miracle walking God. Is a miracle walking God. Is the Alpha.